thank you so much for joining me on the Become a Media Maven podcast. If you are new here, I'm your host. My name is Christina Nicholson. And today I'm super excited to bring you Stacey Tushel. I was on her podcast, which was the Foot Traffic Podcast, which is amazing. And you're going to learn a lot from Stacey just by hearing her story and how she started her business literally in the backyard, grew it to a million dollars, then started teaching other people how to do the same thing. Like, you're going to learn a lot from her, not just by her story, again, but she is talking about some tips that she is including in an upcoming book. We also talk about how she went from a local brick and mortar to online business, and we shared some of our opinions about online business. And if you scroll through Facebook or you listen to podcasts or you're anywhere online, you've probably seen a lot of these online business tactics that we talk about. So I hope you enjoy this episode with my friend Stacey Tushel. Ever wonder how some people seem to get a ton of media coverage and you don't? Welcome to Become a Media Maven, where TV reporter, host, and news contributor Christina Nicholson shares years of media experience to help you get the media attention you and your business deserve. And now, to help you master your media coverage, Christina Nicholson. Hi, Stacy. Thank you for joining me on the Become a Media Maven podcast. Hi, Christina. So excited to be here. So happy you're here. For those of you who do not know Stacy, Stacy, tell people a little bit about what you do because you do a lot. You have like I do. multiple <laughs> successful businesses. So like break it all down. Every time I get introduced and they tell me to tell my story in my head, I've said it a million times, but I still think, what angle am I coming at it from? I know. <laughs> there are so many different aspects. So I, I'll kind of keep it short, but I'll give you a little bit of an overview. So I started right out of high school. I started teaching dancers in my parents' backyard and that became a business. So I have to start there. People are thinking, oh, great. She's going back to high school. But it's because my story really did start there. And um, within three years, we had 100 kids coming to the backyard. And that's when I incorporated it, rented a space, really said, okay, I think I'm going to do this as my career. And um, the backyard story is going to be 18 years old this summer, which is crazy. I now run two children's performing arts academies in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, so I still own them today, but I'm not working in the business. I'm strictly working on it. We have about 52, 53 employees. Uh, we have about a thousand music and dance students that come to us every single week. And we've been grossing a million plus dollars in that business for several years. So I think eventually people started to see this isn't a typical dance studio. Like, I, I don't know. There's not a lot of dance studios, at least in our area that were as booming as we were. And a lot of attention all of a sudden started happening and, and people started, business owners started to say, could I take you to lunch? Could you share with me what you're doing? How are you growing so fast? Like what's going on over there? And then I naturally decided, I think I could start teaching this to other business owners. I, I didn't know what the online world was and that it existed, but about five, actually almost six years ago, I decided I wanted to do something else and add this on, not replace it. But I started teaching other small business owners how to grow their business and just sharing the strategies that I do in my, my brick, brick and mortar business. So it's been a journey. Um, and, and I still, I own everything. We have rental properties, real estate properties. And then we also, I've got two little girls and married to my husband, Kent here in Milwaukee. I love that. Okay. First of all, I love that you are actually like, um, a business coach who has had a successful business online because yeah. I feel like today everybody's like, Oh, I want to be a business coach. I who know. cares if I don't have a successful business? Like you mm -hmm. actually know what you're talking about because you have been there and done that. So that's amazing. Which is why the online business is actually successful because I, ha I use my experience. You know, people are coming to me wanting to do this, but they're not they're like, so I'm really amazing in my dental practice, but I think I'm going to come online and teach. And then they say this topic that has nothing to do with anything that they're good at. Does that make sense? Like, it's crazy. Like what is going on here? But it, it's been, it's been a, a ride and a journey. And I'm really trying to share that with other people. Use what you're good at. Use your experience, your expertise. Um, and that will help you thrive. Not only is that example crazy, but it's also crazy that 
people actually buy shit from those people. Like they believe the marketing and don't do their homework and they spend time and money. And then they're like learning from somebody who has never done what they're, what they're teaching, which honest to God, that happens a lot in college. Like, (laughs) Oh yeah. Like everybody in college, I remember to go off on a tangent. Um, there's a pricey private school down here in South Florida and I was shooting videos there for another company. We were using their studio and I said, oh, you know, I'd like to adjunct for the broadcast journalism class. And they're like, oh, okay, great. Do you have a master's? And I'm like, nope, no master's, but I've worked as a TV reporter and anchor for over 10 years. Um. So definitely know what's up in the industry. And he was like, yeah, you can't do it if you don't have a master's. And I'm like, well, who teaches it now? And they said, oh, you know, so-and-so. And And I said, oh, like, do they, like, what, where do they come from? Like, what, what did they do? Do I know them? Oh, no, they've ever not, they've never actually worked in broadcast journalism, but they have a master's in it. Right. And I'm like, oh, my Lord, like these poor kids are Mm -hmm. paying $40,000 a year to learn broadcast journalism from somebody who has never been a broadcast journalist. Right. Well, and I think there is, especially in the online space, I think people are coming in and they're very insecure. So they're not doing their research, but they, maybe they are doing research, but they think, well, they know more than me, but they, they might only be a couple steps ahead, but they're still struggling themselves. So it's very scary when you are looking to somebody and they aren't really having the results you want to have. It's going to be very hard to learn somebody like this professor who's never actually been an anchor that he might've read some amazing things out of books, but until you do it, Mm -hmm. you don't really fully understand it. Yeah. The books don't tell you what to do when the person running, running the prompter falls asleep and they stop moving the prompter. Like how do you recover from that? They don't tell you those things in the books. (laughs) Yeah. It's unbelievable. Okay. I have a question about you running your children's performing arts academies. So you work on the business instead of in it. Um, A few years ago, I had a problem going from being in the business to working on it. And I know this is a common problem because you have built this thing and now you have to trust others to run it so Mm -hmm. you can do what you want to do and what you need to do. And that's a very scary thing. But once you make that step, it's like, like, hello, I'm grossing a million dollars and I'm not working on it or in it, you know, yeah. like I'm not spending all day every day and I'm grossing a million dollars. So talk to me about that mental transition from being in your business so much and building it for years and years to taking a step back and trusting other people with it. Mm-hmm. So I think people assume when they hear that I'm able to do that, they think, well, she must not be a control freak like me because there's no way I could do that. Right. And I think as entrepreneurs, a lot of us, we naturally are control freaks. We want it our way. We think the way we do it is the right way. I am sure we are very similar. And I remember going to some of these business conferences and and seeing these these magical people that (laughs) own businesses, but weren't actually working in them. And I thought, I want to see what they're doing. And I, I realized that, first of all, it's not an overnight thing. This takes years and it takes a strategy. It takes intentional planning and really, truly building a team that you can trust and building systems that they can follow. So it really still is done your way or the way that you would like to see it. Right. So that's been a huge thing As I always tell people, it wasn't like one day I just decided I'm not working in the business. It was, I love dancing. I was the dance teacher, but I realized at some point I've got to get a few things off my plate. So maybe I you know, the, actually my first transition was really, truly stepping out of the dance class. I knew that it wasn't my sweet spot anymore. And I really wanted to focus on the business. So I hired dance teachers, but then I was working the front desk. So I was actually, if you look at it from a payroll standpoint, I actually stepped out of a higher paying role to do a lower paying desk job. But I knew I needed to start working on the systems the foundation, how do we answer the phone? How do we enroll people? Just really putting those things into place so that I could then say, okay, now I want to hire somebody to help me work two nights a week. Right. And I just kept removing things little by little, but even as I remove them, it's not like you hire somebody and they just take over. You hire somebody and there's three parts to it. They're watching you. They're watching you in action and watching how it gets done. And they're just learning and taking it all in. Step two is you start to do it together. Step three, they start to do it and you observe and give feedback before they actually do it on their own. Most small business owners hire people, 
They think they're going to jump in, take it over week one. And when they don't do what they're hoping that they're supposed to be doing, they fire them or just complain how bad this person is. When really the owner hasn't done their job yet. They haven't trained them in the time frame they need. Uh, there's this phrase about a flower and I love it. It says, if a flower doesn't bloom, it's not the flower's fault. It's the environment's fault, right? They're not getting enough sun, enough water, all those things. And a lot of times that's what we're doing with our team members. I love that. That's so important. Now, when the, when you were doing this, going through this process, that takes a lot yeah. of time. Did you have a Stacey Tushel helping you along or were you just doing like oh. trial and error, figuring it out? Yeah. I'm like, a Stacey Tushel. Yes. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a minute. So- I three, three years into this, when I was just kind of doing this as a hobby, I had no idea what I was doing. I was figuring it out on my own. When I realized it's time to get serious and make this a business, that is actually when it got really complicated, bringing in money, trying to profit. I didn't know what I was doing, hiring people. And I quickly realized how overwhelmed I was. And I got a postcard in the mail. This was way back in 2004, I think, to go to a conference. So I went to a conference and it completely, I, I realized, wow, somebody has already done this. They've done it before me, faster than me. I can do it twice as fast with their help than without. So I actually hired my first coach at the age of 21. And I have had a coach and a mastermind ever since. I've never been without those two. And I think once you have it the first time, you're like, I will never go without. But yeah. I feel like getting it that first time is hard because, and I don't know about you, but for me, this was years ago, I had to get past money mindset problems that I didn't know existed to land my first coach. Was it the same for you or was it different? Yeah. I, I mean, we all have money mindset issues. It's hard for somebody to say they don't because there's all, it, whatever you're comfortable spending, there's a little bit more you might not be comfortable with. So uh, this just shows you my money mindset because that story is what, 15 years ago. And I remember the price of the offer. <laughs> what was Which it? Which is crazy. It was $187 a month. Which is, okay, people, <laughs> if you have not hired a business coach yet in your business, that is freaking nothing. That is yeah. pennies. So, I mean, this was 15 years ago and it was for a group program, but there was a little bit of private involved. And I remember thinking to myself, how am I going to pay for this? Like it was the, like, to me, it was just the most amount of money. And it was scary for me to jump in, but you have to weigh how scary is this? But then like, what could I risk if I don't do it? And I knew in my gut that joining, I'll figure it out. I'll make the money. So I did. And then I started to get addicted to this coaching world because I realized all I need to do to get results is find somebody who's already done it, who's already successful. They're living the lifestyle I want to live too. I'm not into, you know, working 15 hour days and I, I'm not going to do that. Like I'm not interested in that. Right. So I also want to see like, who am I learning from? Because I want to model their lifestyle. I don't want to be trying to get the results of somebody working three times as much as me. Yeah. Right. And I also pay attention to their branding. Like if you're a business coach and your Facebook ad has you posing in the front of a Lamborghini and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> you're holding wads of cash. Yeah, you do you, but you are not my person. <laughs> Absolutely. And and that's the thing. There are so many different people out there that if you're like, I just, you know, I'm not resonating with this person. That's okay. There's a million different people out there and people coming online every day, you know, to help coach and consult. So you just have to really do your homework, like we said in the beginning, and find out it like people, I think, I think people lie and I think people give fake numbers or vanity numbers. So you have to be careful just because like, I just told you my business gross is over a million dollars a year. Now I'm not lying, but you don't know that you don't know if I'm lying, mm -hmm. right? Like there's no way for you to even look up that number. Now, if you go to my studio, you can look at the back of the shirt. You can figure out the amount of dancers we have. You can multiply that. And then you go, yeah, that kind of seems accurate. Right. But some of you don't have access to that. So you really have to be careful and, and ask yourself, is this really what it seems? Yeah. And not only that, but I find, especially in the online space, you have people talking about their seven figure launches and their seven figure yeah. business, but they don't talk about their seven figure expenses either. Absolutely. And I definitely got caught up in that because 
you know, having a million dollar brick and mortar business to me is a big deal and it's a big achievement. Having a million dollar online business is actually not that big of an achievement, which that sounds horrible. But my point is it's really easy to hit a million dollars online and it might not be easy to write the second, but it will be at some point. And what I realized was it's easy to hit. I mean, now people aren't even thinking about a million. A lot of people are talking about the 10 million and the hundred million because they see how easy you can scale online. And I got so sucked up into those vanity numbers that I forgot. It really, for me, what's important is not so much that I can say I did a $5 million launch, but what's in my bank account at the end of the day, how secure and safe do I feel sleeping at night? Do I wake up in the middle of the night worrying about money? That's what I care about, right? And it may be different for you. You may be trying to hit certain goals. So be careful that you don't get caught up in the big numbers because I also have heard somebody who, you know, has, has had seven figure, a seven figure business, but then told us, but I actually spent more than I brought in last year. So you can still be a million dollar company and losing money every single month. Yeah. And I feel like people, you're right. They totally get caught up in those vanity numbers. And yeah. then, yeah, you need to focus on what you're keeping. Like, that's great to make all that money, but what do you actually keep? And then what do you do with what you keep? Like some mm -hmm. people can have an amazing lifestyle that they want making $200,000 a year and keeping a hundred thousand dollars of it. That's their profit. They could live the lifestyle of their dreams. And there's people who maybe they're making more money, but they're like caught up on this hamster wheel. They're living a terrible lifestyle. So it's like, you need to mm. model your business around the lifestyle that you want, whether that be standing in front of Lamborghinis owned or rented, <laughs> I don't judge, or just being able to be like, I'm going to take the day off and go to the movies. Like it's different yeah. for everybody. So yeah, I love that we're, we're sending the message, like don't get caught up in front of the numbers. Okay. Yeah. And I think, I think the more I got involved in masterminds and higher up level masterminds where we we're you know, we're dropping tens of thousands of dollars a year in these programs, I started to see and hear and be connected with other people where, no, they really did rent the Lamborghini for a day for the photo shoot for an hour. I mean, like that stuff really does happen. I can't. Like, they I rent can't with those people. They, yeah, they rent houses in Malibu for their photo shoots and for their videos. And then it looks like it's their house when they don't live there. You know, I mean, it's so you have to be careful and cautious that you're like, I love this and I love their lifestyle, but it's like, do they really live there? Do they really own that? What are they actually doing in their free time? If they even have any free time. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So you started locally, like as local as it can get in your backyard. Yeah. And then yeah. you have these, this, you have these, these brick and mortars, very local. Like if you have a brick and mortar, like that is your thing. You are local. And then you said, okay, mm -hmm. let me teach people how to do what I've done. And that involves you going online. And I feel like a, a big mistake people make is they're like, oh, the internet, I have access to everybody. And it can be overwhelming. Yeah. You don't know where to start. There's so many things because you're online. You really focused on still going online, but remaining local. Yeah, I think the, and trust me, I've had to like refine myself a few times and evolve. And that's just part of the process. And as long as you stick to what you're good at, who you are, what you enjoy teaching, all of that stuff, even when you, you know, evolve a little bit here and there, you come back full circle. So for instance, I, the first online course I ever launched was called Get Focused Academy. And it was all about like Google calendar and email management and setting goals and all of that. Five years later, I'm writing a book called Implementation Code. It's talking about Google Calendar. And, you know, it's like all of the things that I really am actually good at that I want to teach people and share with people. So let yourself evolve, but don't get swayed by watching somebody else and think, oh, I need to do that, right? Like somebody just told me the other day that, um, or I, I heard at the ClickFunnels conference that the biggest funnels that they have running in their software are Amazon resellers. And I swear to you, I was like, I should do that. <laughs> I should do that. Like I get so excited by like the opportunity, right? And I had to go, wait a minute, maybe one day I'll do that. But right now I have not maximized and mastered the area or the programs that I have right now running. And if you keep jumping from one place to another, you're going to be sitting here three years later going, why haven't I done anything yet?
Yeah, because there is there is so much. There's so many things. So I yeah. think just looking at what you already do is great yeah. and looking at where you are. Like I always tell people, I think it's it's a good comparison to talk about going from a local business or even a full-time job to online, right? Like everybody just wants the biggest and the best. It's the same with media coverage. People come to me and they're like, I want Oprah. I want Good Morning America. And I'm like, do you have any local coverage? Like, are you on local TV? Right. Are you in a local newspaper? And they're like, well, no. I'm like, then why would all these these big guys care about you? When they Google you, they see nothing. So I, mm-hmm. I love that you're like, get down to the basics, like keep yeah. it local, start local, and then slowly branch out. I love that. Let's talk a little yeah. bit more about the implementation code. Because yeah, this is absolutely. super this is super important, especially going back to online business. I feel like so many people, they love the content and they love to consume content. They're listening yeah. to the podcast. They're like, okay, great. This is a lot of good information. And then they don't really do anything with it. I know. It's it's it like hurts my heart. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts me when I see people consume, consume, consume. And then I catch back up with them three years later and they're exactly where they were, or they're even actually worse. Like they've gone the wrong direction. They're deeper in debt. They haven't, they don't really have anything to show for it. Right. So a lot of people look at me and they think, wow, like you really do a lot. You get a lot done. I can go, like, I'll speak at a conference and I'll sit, you know, maybe a couple hours and I'll listen to the rest of the speakers before I get back on my plane. And I'll come home from a conference every other week and I'm implementing And a lot of times people are like, how are you doing this, right? How are you actually getting things done? All of that knowledge is great, but it doesn't get you anywhere if you don't do anything with it. And that's like the piece that people miss. And they make so many excuses on why they're not doing anything with it. Yeah. And there's, there's excuses like, well, I'm just overwhelmed. I I picked up so many things and I just don't know what to do next. So their excuses I've got so many great ideas. I think I'll just sit here and do nothing. (laughs) Like, (laughs) let's just think about that, right? Like there's so many reasons it's holding you back from moving forward or you're nervous because you don't know which one. And I always tell people, go with your gut. If you've listened to this podcast and you've heard a bunch of good ideas, even don't even go back and reflect on your notes. Just ask yourself, which one is still standing out in your mind? Like it's standing out in your mind for a reason. Maybe you really think it's a good idea. You're going to enjoy it go with that one first, like see how that feels, but then stay focused on that one. Don't let something else pop up. So even right now, let's say you're listening to this and you already have been working on a big project and you just heard something we've said and you're like, I've got to do this. Ask yourself right now, are you complete with this other project? I'm not saying you can't pick up a new skill and do this thing we're talking about, but put it in your calendar for two weeks when the other project is over, right? If you keep abandoning your goals because something else has popped up, you'll never do anything because you're thinking, no, 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 this is no Stacy. This strategy, this is really the strategy that is going to work. I just heard you say this and now I realize it's it. Next week, you'll hear somebody else say something and you'll completely scrap what I'm doing and you'll move forward. You have to start to put the habit in place of really sticking to something and finishing something. A lot of times we're great starters, but we're not great finishers. I'm a great starter. I don't know, Christina, what are you? Are you a good starter or a good finisher? I am probably a better finisher, I would say, okay. honestly. I think it used to be different, but then I got very, um, I don't know, I guess I got a little bit more patient. I, I well, guess having and, lots of children will do that to you. It'll make you a little yeah. bit more patient. So then I'm like more willing to like see it through. Yeah. And maybe it's something that you've just been mastering the habit of taking action. And now you're a good finisher because that is a skill set. It's not that, oh, I'm a bad finisher. This is never going to work for me. No, you just have to get better at it and practice it. And by doing one thing at a time, that's going to happen. And that's going to be a new habit for you. It reminds me of um, the books Essentialism and The One Thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. I have read both those books. I'm obsessed with the one thing it is. And it's such a good reminder. Even if you're like, Oh, I read that too. Maybe you need to go back and read it, right? You, maybe you need to rinse and repeat the idea that the seven things on your big to-do list today, and I'm not talking like seven little things that you're going to get done in an hour. Some of you have seven gigantic things and one is write a book, right? These are probably not going to happen today. We need to get better at what is the one thing I'm going to do today. And even on my calendar, When I am in the morning from nine to noon, it says my one thing, because I want to remind myself 
this is the time I focus on my one thing for the day. I am going to link to both of those books in the show notes. And then another book, that was that was a great tip. Tip one, being hyper-focused on one thing. Um, yeah. Stacy, I know another tip of yours, which is actually reminds me of another book. I like to read people. Another book that I just read, Atomic Habits, and one of your tips is starting with starting small with habits. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because I have Atomic Habits in eyesight right now. (laughs) It's so good. I love productivity books and just little things like that. Yeah. The starting small, you know, when I saw this person and one of my clients had write a book and it was on her top 10 goals to do soon, I, I immediately said, first of all, this has got to be removed. And I wouldn't have write a book on my goal list. I might have write the seven chapter titles and the intro. You know what I mean? Like that seems way more tangible than I'm going to write a book. And then you have no idea how long it's going to take or what that's going to look like. So really breaking apart into small tasks, right? I mean, you might be thinking, yeah, but you have to write, if you really want to write the book, that is the big goal. Yes. But how do we make it not feel that overwhelming? If you have write a book on your to-do list, what is a good day in the next 30 days or 60 days that you could set aside time? You probably are thinking that's such a big task. I'd have to reserve a whole day or a whole week, right? But when I say to you, I would love for you to get me seven chapter titles, just an idea, maybe just a topic. Um, when could you do that by? You could probably do that today in an hour, right? So then it all of a sudden starts to become more attainable because you believe you can actually accomplish it and throw it in your schedule somewhere because we're all busy. I love that. And that goes very well with being hyper-focused on one thing. And I want to get to one more tip that you talked about in the implementation code. And that is, again, this ties in with the first two, prioritizing things. And specifically, I mean, you don't, I don't know if you talk about this or not, but for me, when I think of prioritizing, I think of prioritizing two things, time and money because a Mm. personal pet peeve of mine, well, I guess it's a professional pet peeve of mine as well, is when people say, I don't have money or I don't have time. And it's like, no, 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 you have the money and you have the time. You are just prioritizing to spend it in a different way. Absolutely. So everybody has their top priorities. And honestly, if I looked at your calendar and your bank account, I could tell what they are. Now, you may not agree with me, but it's a fact where you spend your time and where you spend your money is what you are telling everybody is your priority, right? Including yourself. So those are usually two places we start with by looking, how do we feel about what's going on our calendar, right? If you told me your priority was writing a book and then we looked at your calendar and it is nowhere to be found, you might want to do that, but you're not actually committing to doing it right in the moment. So I think the biggest thing you can do to combat overwhelm is it's okay to have 10 gigantic goals, but they need to be in order of priority, right? So if I have 10 big goals that I want to get done for today, even I'm going to label them. Maybe there's going to be three high priorities, three medium and three low. And even in those categories, I'm going to put them in order of what I want to get done. We have to stop doing the easy tasks, the things we like to do, or they're, they're going to take just 30 seconds when you know you've got to sit down and record a podcast, right? Or, or you know you have to do something that's due today. We have to put them in order of importance. And that's what it comes to is prioritizing. And not just for me, but if you have a team, I, I have a million things on my to-do list, but then you know what I do? I give a million things to every single person working for me. And then they get overwhelmed because maybe they don't know, they can't read my mind and they're thinking, well, she gave me this, but now she just told me to do this. And she said it was urgent. So where does the priority happen? Right? So what I like to do when I give assignments to my team is I put them in order of importance for them because sometimes people on my team, right? They naturally, just like I would do, they pick, ooh, this looks fun. This looks easy. This looks like it would be something I could do this afternoon, right? Versus, no, 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 we need to do this first. So my team knows you don't work on a low priority until your highs and mediums are done. And the only way you get to go from one high to another is if you get stuck on that first one, right? So if you're waiting for me for something great, send that shoot, that email or message over through our project management system, and then start working on the second one in order of importance until I've replied back, right? So little things like that will help you accomplish all of the things, but in the right order. And it'll actually help you complete before you move on to doing three things at once. You can't spread your yourself too thin. I love that. And I, I it drives me crazy whenever people 
have the excuse of no time or no money. Mm-hmm. And it's it's like, no, no, no. Especially the time one, it's a little easier for people to understand they can make time. And then with money, they always go to the bank account. And I always counter that with, well, do you have a house? Okay, what's your house cost? 300000 Did you have 300000 sitting in the bank when you bought the house? <laughs> What about your car? Did you just like open up your wallet and buy your car? What about college? Like people spend their whole lives Mm -hmm. paying for college literally until they retire. Like, I don't think you had all that money in the bank. So like, I mean, even look at, you know, your experience with business coaching, my experience with business coaching. Like we, I mean, I know for my first business coach, I was like, I don't have this money, but I'm going to take out a loan and I'm going to do every single thing this person tells me to do. So I can pay it off in a year. And because I did every single thing that person told me to do, I paid it off in six months. And then the next business coach, I actually had all the money in the bank account to just pay for it. Like Mm -hmm. when you start prioritizing things as it aligns with your goals and then you create those strategies around it, like y'all, you could be like Stacey Tushel with all of these seven figure businesses. Yeah. Well, and What's funny too is I, I see this all the time as well. And, and I'm, I'm doing this. I'm making, taking these steps. So yesterday I just bought something that is going to be $18,000 and it was, it was like three payments of, or sorry, six payments of $3,000. Now I have the money in the bank account, but the, the idea here is not to use the money in the bank account. The idea here is I'm going to spend $3,000 and within 30 days, I want to already start making my money back. So I'm always asking myself when I go to invest, I'm like, is this an expense or is this a revenue generator? Because if you're thinking, oh shoot, this is $18,000. I'm looking at my savings like, oh, no, no, no. I'm not looking at this as an expense. I invested in a revenue generator and I am on a mission to make sure I make at least the $3,000 a month to get it back and then some. And then after the six payments is over, I'll continue to make that money, right? So you have to ask, like, what am I buying here? Am I buying a pair of shoes that, they're not going to do anything for me and they're not, I'm not going to resell them and they're going to lose value and I'm going to buy another pair later. Right. Or is this something that could actually make, bring in more money? I love that. I love that. So people can find more about you, um, at your website, which I will link to in the show notes. You also have the foot traffic podcast where you share yes, more you. of this amazing knowledge. Where else can people find you, Stacey? So on social media, I'm pretty much everywhere at Stacey Tushel. Um, the podcast is definitely a great place to get started. And then I have a free Facebook group that kind of goes with the podcast called Foot Traffic Community. Perfect. I will link to all of that in the show notes so people can find you. Stacey, is there anything that you want to add that maybe I did not ask? No, um, just stay tuned. My implementation code book is going to be out in the next few months. And I just can't wait to really dive in deep and help more people take action and implement because we all have these goals and I just want to make sure that these goals aren't just sitting there, right? Sitting on a shelf, but you, they actually turn into your business results. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stacey. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, I am linking to all of those amazing books in the show notes. And then I'm also going to link to my bookshelf. So on my website, I actually keep a long running list of all of the books that I am reading, both fiction and nonfiction, because I love a good fiction book. Um, So make sure to check that out. That is in the show notes. And if you have any ideas for future shows or future guests, make sure you tweet me or hit me up on Instagram. I am at Christina all day because I want to hear your ideas. Thank you so much for listening. And I will see you again for another episode next week.